What do you know about it, Chigilski? What do any of us know about anything? Hi, everyone. Jim Jagelski here. I do appreciate you stopping by. Thank you very much for checking out this latest video. Now, in previous episodes of my series on my 6502 base computer, we've looked at the design and architecture of the board, as well as the 6502 assembly code, which powers the system. Today, we'll be talking about the Raspberry Pi Pico, which I'm using as a sort of AVIO chip, or in other words, the system console chip. Now, what's a console? In computer terms, the system console is the main terminal for the computer. It's the primary interface that the person uses to interface with the computer. So in this case, it's the PS2 keyboard as well as the VGA output. That also includes not only the VGA signaling, but also the data that's presented on the VGA monitor. Now, of course, you can have other terminals as well using the RS-232 interface right there, but the console is the primary one. And it's the Raspberry Pi Pico right here, which is implementing all the text, graphics, I.O., A.V., and sound capability inherent in the JJ65CO2 board. So let's take a look at the Raspberry Pi Pico itself. As you can see, it has the same form factor as the more traditional Raspberry Pi, but whereas the Raspberry Pi is a computer, the Raspberry Pi Pico is a microcontroller powered by the RP2040 chip right here seen in the middle of the board. The RP2040 is a dual core processor running at 125 megahertz with an onboard memory allocation of 265 kilobytes, yes, that's right, kilobytes of memory. Also included is flash, which is where your program gets loaded and run. Now, although the board can be easily overclocked to about 250 megahertz or faster, the real power and capability of this board comes from some additional features which are on the 2040 chip itself. And these include DMA capability, as well as programmable I.O., otherwise known as PIO. DMA allows for large amounts of data and memory to be transferred without any involvement with the CPU at all. This means that instead of the CPU having to worry about copying and transferring data, that is offloaded to the DMA subsystem. The PIO capability adds eight small mini coprocessors, which are dedicated to performing I.O. operations on the various GPIO pins. Again, this means that instead of your program having to worry about flipping GPIO pins on and off or reading data on those pins, the PIO subsystem performs all that functionality independent of the CPU and provides that information when the CPU and your program wants and needs it. As we mentioned earlier, the Raspberry Pi Pico is responsible for three main functions on the JJ65CO2 board. The first is the sound generation and output capability. The second is the VGA output, which includes not only the VGA signaling, but also the text and graphics capabilities which are displayed on the VGA monitor. And thirdly, the PS2 keyboard interface. We'll start off 
by actually going into more depth on how the Pi Pico handles the interface between the PS2 keyboard and the 6502 system itself. Let's first remind ourselves how a PS2 keyboard sends the scan code data to the host computer. As we can see, the protocol is serial, which means that each bit is sent after the other. In the case of the PS2 keyboard, once a keyboard action is enabled, the keyboard will start generating a clock signal, and on the trailing edge will start sending the data corresponding to the data bit. On the trailing edge of the clock signal, the data is available to be read. It's available to be read up until the rising edge. So the pattern is trailing edge, data is ready, rising edge, data is done. This is done for each of the data bits corresponding to the scan code. At the very end, a parity bit and a stop bit are sent to indicate the end of the data transmission. The eight data bits correspond to the actual scan code of the keyboard action that the PS2 keyboard has seen. So now let's look at how we program the Raspberry Pi Pico to handle not only reading in the scan code from the PS2 keyboard, but also how it converts it to ASCII and then sends that ASCII character to the 6502. In this particular case, we're using the PIO subsystem, which is really ideally suited to this sort of problem set. As a reminder, the PIO can be thought of as a very small, simple um, coprocessor that is independent of the main dual CPU that is on the Pi Pico. It is extremely limited. In fact, you can only program it with up to 32 statements and the opcodes that are available to it are again very limited. Basically some logic functions being able to look for pin values and then storing pin values. But as I said before, in this case, that's exactly what we need. Because the PS2 keyboard uh, clock signal and data signal are connected to two independent GPIO pins, what we need the PIO program to do is look for that clock signal, the transitions on the clock signal, and then reading in each individual bit of information that's coming in on the data line and combining them to create the actual scan code. And that's what this program right here does. At the very start, we wait for the clock signal to go low. And once that's done, we know that that was the start bit and that the next bits coming in will actually be the data bits for the scan code. We set a counter to seven because we're actually going to be reading in eight bits of data. And we null out the input register that is used to hold the data that's coming in. And the way it works is that as the clock signal goes low, we read in one bit of data from the data line, and that gets stored in the input register. We then wait for the clock to go high again, and we loop in to read the next data bit that's coming in. As each bit is read in, the input register gets shifted. So what we're doing is reading in a bit, storing it in the register. The register shifts over to create space for the next incoming bit, which is then put inside that new space. That is completed eight times until we get all eight bits, at which point we know that the next two bits coming in 
will be the parity bit and the stop bit. In this particular case, we're not really worried about those values, although it would be uh, an idea for a later version to actually check the parity bit and make sure that we received it correctly, but we're ignoring that for now. But once we read in all eight bits of data and have finished up with the parity and stop bit, we send an interrupt to the main program to let it know that we have read in the scan code. So the main program can now operate on this newly received data set. We're now looking at the main C program that handles the conversion of the scan code, as well as sending that information to the 6502. And it must be noted that the development environment for the PyPico is very different than the environment for the 6502. Now you can program the PyPico in either C or Python, but because Python is interpreted in the same way that BASIC is interpreted, in this particular case, it's really not well suited for something that we need high performance on. So we're using C in this case right here. Now, the program sets up a couple of include files. So we have uh, the required functions and capability from the C SDK for the PyPico. Redefining some variables as well as the interrupt handler for the PS2 keyboard handler. Let's actually take a quick look at the interrupt handler. And there it is right there. As a reminder, at this point in time, the interrupt handler is called when we have eight bits of data that represent the scan code as sent by the PS2 keyboard and as read by the PIO subsystem. First, we check to make sure that the, uh, the FIFO, the queue that's used to send data between the PIO subsystem and the main system um, is, is not empty. If for some reason is, is empty, we clear the interrupt and return. But most of the time, it's not empty because we have the eight bits of data that we just read. Now, due to the architecture of the RP2040 and it being a little Indian machine, those eight bits that we just read in are closer to the uh, most significant bit of the 32-bit word register than the bottom least significant bit. So that means that to actually get an 8-bit character out of that, we need to shift that 32-bit word 24 spots to the right. And that's what this line right here does, is takes the 32-bit the word and converts it to an 8-bit character, unsigned character, with those 8 bits at the lower end of the structure. We then switch on that code, the scan code that we've received. If you remember, again, how the PS2 keyboard works, it sends scan codes for things like key press, key up, key down, shifts, and things of that nature. And so the code that we have needs to respond to those events. And we use some Boolean flags as state variables to figure out where we are in the process. For example, if the code that we received is an F0, that means that what we actually receive is a key release event. By knowing which keys have been entered and where we are in the key press release cycle, we can determine whether or not the value that we're reading in now is actually a key value or an event value. So we handle events such as the caps lock being uh, pressed down, the left and right shift 
keys being pressed and the left and right control key being pressed. Because remember, those modify the actual key value. When a shift Q, for example, is sent, the scan code does not represent a capital Q, but instead say, hey, the shift key was pressed and I'm sending you a Q, and it's up to the program to figure out, oh, that means it's an uppercase Q. And that's what these flags right here do. If we're not handling any special keys, the shift keys, control keys, or things like that, then it means that this is an actual key value itself. It corresponds to one of the characters on the, on the key. And we want to convert that to ASCII. We have some flags in here that says if we, you know, right now ready to see what the actual key value is, we need to determine if the control key was pressed at the same time, if the shift key was pressed or not, and then change the value of that ASCII character to correspond to the control value of that. The ASCII character for C is different for one which is a control C and is different for a shift C, which is a capital C. And that's what this code right here does. To do the actual conversion, we have some tables here which map the scan code as coming in from the PS2 keyboard to the actual ASCII values that those scan codes correspond to. If we're looking at lowercase values, then this table is used. And as you can see, inside it are all the lowercase ASCII values. If instead the shift key was pressed and we are in shift key mode, then we use the ASCII upper table, which is this table right here, in which those ASCII values correspond to their uppercase values rather than their lowercase values. And finally, if the control key was pressed right there, then we use this conversion table, which maps the scan code to the actual ASCII code that will be sent to the 6502. Now, most of those are non-printable characters, and that's the reason why, instead of seeing the, the actual character codes themselves, you see some hex values, which map to the non-printable actual values themselves. Once we've now converted the scan code, the actual ASCII code, we store that in a small keyboard buffer and then clear the interrupt. So that way we can now read in the next character coming in from the PS2 keyboard. The actual task that's used to correspond and coordinate all this activity is the PS2 task. The first thing that happens is we go to see if we actually have a character in our input buffer, which is the PS2 get care routine right there. And that's it. As I mentioned, what happens is that it looks to see if the read pointer and the write pointer are not the same. If they're not the same, that means that we have data in the buffer. We pull that out and return it as an ASCII value. We then, of course, update the read buffer because we don't want to reread the same character. If a character is available, then what we want to do is put that bit pattern on the seven GPIO pins that are connected to the VIA chip on the 6502 board. We use the VIA interface because we want some sort of handshaking between the Pi Pico and the 6502 so that when the Pi Pico sends the ASCII character, the 6502 can respond, okay, I got it, thanks. So the first thing we do is get that ASCII character. We go ahead and put it 
on the six data pins that are connected between the Pi Pico and the VIA chip. We only need seven pins, not eight, because the top bit is not used in the uh, PS2 keyboard uh, protocol interface. We then flip the signal line that is connected to the handshake line on the VIO chip. And we set that high. So the VIA chip knows that data is now available for it to read on the seven incoming lines. And then we wait a bit give the 6502 and the VIA time to read the data off those lines and then turn off that internal interrupt, that internal handshake to the VIA chip. Now, people may be wondering why I'm manually changing and setting these pins and not using the PIO subsystem. And that's mostly because this is a low bandwidth operation. And so we really don't need the fast speed or the independent activity of a PIO for this particular case. And so using the standard C SDK and setting the pins high and low manually using the system calls is perfectly acceptable in this case. And with that, I think that's enough for now. Later episodes will include the sound capability and the VGA capability, but I think they each deserve their own independent videos. Again, thank you very much for watching this video. And if you have any comments or suggestions, please don't hesitate to reach out. You can do so either via comments below or via X slash Twitter, where I'm at Jim Jag. Thanks a bunch. See you at the next video.